I'm Stuart Lloyd. I'm a member of the Ballymena Church Members Forum, uh, a body which seeks to bring together people and seeks, especially from uh, different faith perspectives, and to perhaps build a more cohesive society. And when I heard of this project, looking back, looking forward, I thought, well, the forum should be involved in that. And because I have an interest in Irish history, uh, I was drawn in. And I was particularly interested to find out a little bit more about a former rector in Ballymena, because I'd been rector there for 27 years. And back in 1921, the rector was the Reverend John Cullen. So I did a little bit of research about him. And I was intrigued to find that uh, he, before coming to Ballymena, he'd been a missionary in India for 26 years. And I myself have a mission partnership with India over a period of 30 years and have been to India many times. So this was something we shared together. But also he served with the uh, Church Missionary Society. And my own father was uh, organizing secretary of that body for many years. So in a sense, we shared quite a bit. I have researched the church records of St. Patrick's Ballymena before, and I'm aware that very often they're very parochial and they don't refer to political matters or matters going on out in the world. And I wondered, was that the same in 1921? And at first sight, it did seem to be. There was things about, you know, boilers breaking down and the numbers attending services and confirmation candidates and so forth. But then I came across a, a, a report in the Banamina a weekly telegraph of the 9th of April, and I found it fascinating because at the beginning of this, a vote of condolence was passed to the curate, the Reverend J.P. Cotter, on the death of his brother. How had he died? He'd been assassinated by the IRA in County Cork. So clearly the troubled state of the country in some way impinged upon the parish. But also, at such events, the rector gives a report, and normally, again, it's very parochial. But not in this case, in 1921, because so much of the report was given over to the troubled state of the country and the political situation. And the rector was very forthright in his views and giving expression to those. And it was very clear the cause that he espoused and indeed, it was clear how he was going to vote in forthcoming elections and how he expected the parishioners to vote. So although looking at the records, it might have appeared that the church was, in a sense, quite removed at what was going on in the country, the reality was that, in fact, the state of the country did impinge upon uh, the parish and upon parishioners. And today, uh, surely even more so, I reckon that the church should very much be involved in the public square because it certainly has a vital contribution to make there. My name is Roberta and uh, Jackie and I are the Grace Hill Moravian Church Archivists and we are sitting here just in front of the archives. We were asked to research the events in the life of the church in 1921 and our interest really deepened as the time went on. Uh, we were struck by the fact that there wasn't much political comment uh, on the situation at the time and that things were just going on as normal. According to the Grace Hill Diaries, two sad events happened in August of that year. Uh, with the deaths of two young boys aged 13 and 12. One was killed at his own front door instantaneously having uh, ridden his bike into a trap. The other was drowned in the River Main when he was out um, swimming. Apart from these sad stories, uh, life in Grace Hill went on pretty much uh, as usual. Uh, buildings including the church were painted, um, paths were cleared, the burial ground was tidied up, fences were erected and in the village square a fair was held uh, to raise funds for 
the um, erection of a new belfry and also for the erection of a memorial in the church to those members of the Moravian Church who had served in the First World War. In January 1921, plans were made for this uh, memorial. Uh, it was to be made of uh, brass and mounted on black uh, marble. Uh, it was to contain all the names of those who had lost their lives or who had taken part uh, in the First World War. Uh, it, one thing unusual about it is the fact that it recorded the women's names as well as the men's. And that was unusual for uh, that time. It was unveiled on the 29th of May 1921 by Mrs Rogers. The diary records that 275 people were present. It was a cold and showery day and the offering was £5.13 and sixpence. The only mention in the Grace Hill Diaries of any trouble in the area um, concerning partition was the fact that a trip by the Moravian uh, congregation here uh, to Belfast Moravian churches was called off because of the disturbed state in the city. The Belfast Moravian church members had to make detours to actually get to their church services and in Dublin it was decided by the Moravian church to hold its uh, weekly evening meetings in the House of Members uh, because again of the disturbed state of the city and in 1922 the Moravian church was actually closed because of the fierce fighting around it. In his recollections, James Mitchell, who was a member of the Grace Hill Moravian church and a local school teacher, he records it like this. In 1920, Ulster got the right of self-government and immediately opposition arose to render such government impossible. Incendiary fires broke out in all directions over Ulster and bridges were blown up so that Ulster people had a time of trial. But this was overcome by the exercise of patience and perseverance. I'm Jennifer McLernan and I'm a member of Ballymena Church Members Forum and we decided to look at what was going on in church life uh, in Ballymena in 1921 and maybe have a bit of a comparison of what it was like today. Generally in 1921 there seemed to be, there certainly were reports or accounts of good goodwill and cooperation between the denominations. Uh, one particular example that we found was a meeting of a protection committee which was called um, by the Urban Council. It was attended by uh, the public meeting attended by all the ratepayers in the town uh, and at that meeting um, the, the parish priest uh, spoke out uh, about the, the good will and the good relations among people of, as he put it, all creeds and classes in Ballymena. Uh, he was doing that in, in his, uh, when he was seconding uh, a, a proposal that had been put by one of the Presbyterian ministers in the town about the formation of this committee. And that, that resolution was carried, according to the press report, with applause from the large group of people that were there. Uh, there, was, there was an example, we certainly found an example of, of sectarianism. Uh, the, the parish hall belonging to the, uh, the main Catholic church in the town was burnt uh, round, about, round about that same, um, same time. Now, I then particularly focused on uh, West Church, which was one of the Presbyterian churches in the town, had been there since the mid-19th century, uh, or early 19th century, in fact. And um, I think it, it was one of five, five Presbyterian churches in the town. Today, there's actually eight Presbyterian churches in the town. But looking at that, um, a lot of things were very similar to what they are today. I mean, there was Sunday worship, two services on a Sunday, uh, morning and evening. There were Kirk session meetings, committee meetings. There was all sorts of organizations and activities, very similar to what, the, what there is today. But th there were some differences. For example, uh, there was a temperance group called the Band of Hope, and uh, its role was very much to um, 
encourage uh, or discourage the use of alcoholic liquor as, as a beverage. Um, for the first time in the church's history, a woman was elected to the church committee, which was the committee that oversaw sort of the non-spiritual life of the church. Uh, she was proposed by one of the men and was, was brought onto the committee, so, so that was a first. Uh, there was a town deaconess who actually worked among the three, there, sorry, the five Presbyterian churches in the town. Now, she was one of the first deaconesses um, ordained in the Presbyterian Church in Ireland in the, in the early part of the um, 20th century. Uh, one, one other little incident or, or, or situation which definitely is very different today was, was the pipe organ. There was an 183 pipe organ. Now, it depended on its operation on a water supply, uh, which drove the mechanism that, that made the organ work. Now, that water supply was um, allowed or, or by the Urban Council, the, uh, the Urban District Council, and they allowed it free for, for worship services in the church. But when the organist wanted to give private tuition to anybody, which he could do on, with, with the agreement of the Kirk Session, the water had to be paid for. Um, th there was other things that, that again are maybe some way similar today. Uh, for example, there were people, uh, there was congregational members who certainly held roles, significant roles within the congregation. Um, the, the clerk of session uh, at the time was also the, the superintendent of the uh, Sabbath school, as it would have been called. Um, and he was the principal of the Bal of Balamina Technical College at the time. There was also, in those days, a number of afternoon Sabbath schools that would have been run in the town. Now, those were open <coughs> to people of all, of, well, it probably were aimed at people of no faith uh, or no denomination. And uh, they wouldn't have just been for children. O older people could have gone to those as well, too. Uh, and West Church congregation, a number of people there would have helped to superintend those and teach them and probably uh, supported them financially as well, too. My name's Joanne Brown Kerr and I'm involved with an organisation called Fan Main West Community Cluster. We were absolutely delighted to be involved with this project. At Fan Main West have been involved with quite a few uh, shared history projects in the past and really learnt a lot and really got a lot out of them. So whenever we seen this project we thought, uh, yes, this is something that we could be involved with and our volunteers, we have two or three uh, very passionate volunteers about, about history, about shared history and researching into different projects. So we knew we had a bit of expertise around the table to, to, to look at a couple of different areas. So, so then I suppose the next thing was looking at what theme we were going to look at through the project. So we decided to look at sense of place, uh, which immediately sprung out to us because we wanted to really see, uh, we wanted to look at two villages, Kaliwaki and Portland and how things have changed in the past hundred years. So we started off with a few photographs, um, very interesting photographs actually, of the, the main streets of Portland and Kaliwaki. Um, very interesting just to see how things have drastically changed between then and now. Uh, but that took us into uh, a wee bit more depth because we started to look at one of our volunteers then found a wee bit of information on the local school in Kaliwaki, Buick Memorial Primary School. And we started to delve into that wee bit deeper, so we got some information on the pupils and parents' occupation and what they did at school and uh, all sorts of information about that time, which you know we thought was fascinating actually. So we spoke to a few local people as well about their, not obviously their experiences a hundred years ago, but actually their parents and information had been passed down about you know their experiences at school. So it was great to hear um, from some of the local people and also some of the school children as well about their experiences now. So that was great. Uh, that was Kalibaki then Portland Own. We focused in on the bank, Northern Bank in Portland Own. Lots of history around the bank there. And uh, we, we looked into that in a wee bit more detail and again kind of looked at how things were then compared with, with now. And actually the Northern Bank in Portland Own now has just recently opened as a community hub uh, and is run by Portland Own Enterprise Group. So uh, a great project there. And actually 
quite a bit of the research that we've been looking at will be included in the community hub in the bank uh, and it gives people a wee bit of, of history about the building so so that's been uh, really really good and I suppose to finish off what have we got out of it we've really enjoyed the project we have uh, gathered lots of information but this isn't the end of it we're going to actually carry on and, and look at schools uh, we're going to develop that wee bit of research we've started and look a wee bit more at the schools but I suppose the key thing for us and our volunteers has been you know it's a bit of history it's a bit of heritage it's 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 um, having that recorded somewhere having that in a book or having that on a display so that that's there for future generations to come so as I mentioned at the start delighted to have been involved and, and, and hope to continue with the work that we've started my name is Linda Hook and I see Larne as my hometown. Um, I've been working in Larne Museum for over 10 years, uh, which I enjoy very much. Um, I've always loved history and just being in the museum and seeing things that perhaps aren't always on display uh, is, is very interesting. For some time I've been following the, the history of my family. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of time in Prony and found some very interesting things about the family farm. Uh, it came into the family in 1845 and it used to stay there on holiday. Uh, it's not very far from Larne, about three miles. And uh, whilst I didn't appreciate the old building at the time, now that I've learned its history, it's something that uh, I'm very proud has been in my family. In those days, farmers rented their farms from uh, a landlord. Uh, in the case of my grand, great grandfather's, it was uh, Viscount Dungannon. So, for over a hundred years, they paid their rent twice a year, and whatever they made um, apart from that was theirs. In 1903, there, were, there was a land act um, in England and Ireland, and it enabled farmers to buy their farms for the first time. It meant that they, whatever improvements they were doing, um, they got to keep, uh, they were secure, they, they couldn't be evicted. So it was something that appealed to, to most farmers. But in 1919, my great grandfather could have bought the farm, but he in fact chose not to. I knew that um, the farm had been, original, uh, had been bought eventually, so I thought I would look into the records and find out just when it was bought. Um, there's a database based on the Griffith evaluation. Um, around 1860, a man called Griffith um, did a survey of Ireland and looked at all the farms um, and uh, valued them uh, of what the rent should be. So I was able to look at those records and find out that in fact, uh, my ancestors rented the farm right up until the 1920s. Uh, I couldn't find exactly what year that my, my grandfather bought the farm, but I do know that he, he didn't have it in 1926 or 1929 when the last records uh, were, are available. So as he died in 1933, I can just assume that he bought it around about 1932. So that meant that for the first time, my family were working the farm and it was theirs. I'm Steve Diamond. I'm a historian, artist from Whitehead and the centenary of Northern Ireland and the collection in Carrickfergus Museum immediately kicks off thousands of stories. So where do you start? And a good place to start is the 1920s, looking back from the 2020s. I mean, here we are today and we're worried about the protocol, Brexit, COVID-19, and it's a shock when you look at the 1920s. You have people dealing with the Spanish flu pandemic, which killed 50 to 100 million. It was far worse. They didn't know what a virus was, let alone a vaccine. They'd just been through World War I partition. Um, their problems were enormous. But in the collection here, you have the chain of office of Whitehead Urban District Council, which was a bunch of people who proposed giving the town urban powers and got together and 
put together a census to prove Whitehead had enough people. And these people had faith in the future and they wanted to build things. You know, they built the swimming pool, they repaired the promenade, which was wrecked by sea storms. They gave us all better roads uh, and housing, affordable housing so that the town could grow. One of the people on the very first Whitehead Town Council has a very interesting name. He's Fideli Bonugli, or he's an Italian immigrant. Back there, apparently, it's called Bonugli. And his story is very astonishing. Um, his mother dies after childbirth and five of the children, he's in his 20s, he, he brings four of his siblings. They go to the coast of Scotland, to Stranraer, as immigrants. You imagine he's just got a suitcase. He ends up in, in Larne and Whitehead as this very successful landowner, farmer, ice cream salesman. Uh, he has shops in Whitehead and he is the most popular person on that council. He tops the poll with the most votes. And his story is very extraordinary for someone coming from abject poverty as an emigrant to this country. I'm Adrian Hack. I've always had an interest in events during the Second World War, largely because my mum was a young girl in Eindhoven in Holland during the Second World War and lived under occupation and often would have shared her stories. But more recently, I've been interested in events closer to home in my hometown of Carrick Fergus during the same period. And last year, the Carrick Fergus Museum uh, released a photograph on Facebook, which was basically entitled Women's Volunteers in Carrick Fergus during the Second World War. And it was a picture of about 80 women, some in uniform, but a lot in sort of civilian clothing, but with badges and armbands on. And I couldn't figure out what it was all about. And, and that sent me off on a bit of a, a research mission. We started looking at websites, I was looking at council minutes, newspaper archives, and the story I uncovered actually found quite fascinating. Basically the women in Carrick Fergus came together and did a huge amount for the local population. Fundraising for the war effort, making clothes for evacuees, making camouflage nets to be used by the military. And they kept themselves busy for the entire duration of the war. And it made me really understand that Although events around the Second World War tend to be around Dunkirk and D-Day and the Battle of Britain, but back at home people had to you know, keep calm and carry on, and that's exactly what happened here in Carrick Fergus, and the women played a huge part in that. So I'm full of admiration for all those who volunteered in Carrick Fergus to step up to the plate at the country's greatest need, and for that reason I just still think that they were actually the greatest generation. Hello, I'm Helen Clark, Honorary Secretary of the Carrick Fergus District Historical Society. The Society has been working with the Mid and East Antrim Borough Council on their Looking Back to Look Forward programme as part of the NI100 commemorations. The Society has been working with the Carrick Fergus Museum on a project looking at Carrick Fergus in the 1970s. As part of the project, we've looked at some home movies, we've used uh, newspapers and TV archives and also looked at photographs and town guides held by the museum to develop a map of Carrick Fergus in the 1970s. Some of the photographs we looked at were of Back Carrick Week. Back Carrick Week was established in the late 1960s based on the I'm Backing Britain campaign and was a highlight of the year. Most people remember Back Carrick Week fondly from the children's three-legged race and fancy dress competitions to the fun pet shows and of course the international cart racing around the marine gardens, not to mention the highly contested competitions for piano smashing, pie eating and uh, the raft race as well as waitress racing and the greasy pool competition. Over the years there has also been a variety show of the good old days style with prizes for co costumes of the audience and also a closely fought football match between UTV and BBC TV presenters. The members of the society have very much enjoyed working with the museum on this project and looking back at these photographs have really brought back some very happy memories.